Welcome to Enemies from War to Wisdom. Why do we need enemies? From intimate relationships to politics, tribalism, and community, we cannot seem to stop dehumanizing each other. Chronic conflicts in our families, societies, and nations seem inevitable. In this podcast, we analyze human hostilities from the most mundane to the most sophisticated. We apply psychology, psychoanalysis, art, spirituality, and relational theory in conversations about belonging and othering. Each program reaches for a fresh wisdom that shows us how to step back from creating enemies in our lives. I'm your host, Jill Abelock, a book artist, end-of-life doula and spiritual caregiver, and mindfulness meditation teacher. I'm here with my co-host, Polly Young Eisendrath, who is a psychologist, Jungian analyst, author, and speaker. We approach our ideas each from our own worlds, but always from the spirit and teachings of Buddhism, of which we are lifelong practitioners. Today's podcast is on the snow globe of our subjectivity, why it's so hard to agree. In earlier podcasts, we've talked about what it means to be a human being, an individual person who has a complex experience of seeing, hearing, and feeling. In this episode, we will go into the details of the individual world of being human and why it's so hard for us to agree about what is happening from moment to moment. Our perceptions of reality are between about 45 and 85% individual at any given moment. That means that we are not in the same world, and consequently, we don't share the same meanings about what is going on. We base our ideas and actions on the meanings we perceive and not on reality as it is. For that reason, we need to study the nature of reality and to be modest about our perceptions. In this podcast, we will talk about both of these subjects and why the metaphor of a snow globe works very well to depict the nature of our individual subjectivity. Joining us today will be Eleanor Johnson, former co-host of this podcast, who's also a videographer and artist with Emma Troop, an experimental theater group in New York City. Hi, Eleanor. It's wonderful to have you here. Hi, Jill. And hi, Polly. It's great being with you again. Yes. It's great to be here, as usual. I thought that we might start with, if it's, if it's okay with the two of you, with this issue about what is reality. Because I think that there's a lot of confusion about that. And a lot of times people say things like, you know, you should get with the real world. Or, you know, you should be in reality. And yet, without any real knowledge of what reality is, people assume that that reality is what they perceive as happening around them. They, they assume that it's what they see and what they hear and the way they feel, particularly outside of their bodies. They assume that's the real world. And then what's inside is the subjective world or the individual world. And actually, it's really quite different from that. In here, when I say, really, I'm going to be basing a lot of this on a combination of cognitive science as it exists these days, and guess what? Buddhism, (laughs) as it exists these days. So I'd like to start with talking about reality, especially from a Buddhist perspective, but that doesn't fall so far from contemporary cognitive science. And so I I wonder if, if, if either of you want to jump in right now and say, you know, how you regard reality and whether you want to put the quotes around it or you just want to say this is the way I you know I think about reality or experience reality I'd be happy to let somebody else take the lead on that well one thing that comes to me is I'm wondering if our beliefs affect how we see reality yeah of course of course yeah. but but when you say how we see reality what right. is reality exactly <laughs> what well, we would what we would consider reality well, what is I guess for me, reality ties into the deeper values and the deeper kind of knowledge and wisdom that I have, that that affects the way I see reality. So that which is out in front of me, just because it's out in front of me, doesn't necessarily 
hold the weight of, quote, reality for me. I, you know, I infuse it with my own, I guess, my own value systems and in terms of what I, yeah, my own preferences or beliefs or whatever. Yeah, I, I don't think that, I think that influences how I see what's real or what I consider to be real. And that's a good different. I mean, yeah. there's a bit of uh, you. You you gave a nice difference to what I consider to be real. Probably would help you in talking to somebody else mm-hmm. because the other person might have something else that they consider exactly. to be real. Yes. And where people get into arguments is if they think there is something that is objective that needs to be established as reality. Like, you know, let's get with the real world. Right. Or let's keep the news honest and focused on reality. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Or let's make sure this lines up with reality. Those are kind of popular ideas mm-hmm. about reality. And I think that, generally speaking, the assumption is that there is some reality that we could all agree on. Right. That's reality. Yeah. And that, So, Jill, I wonder what... What you think about in regard to reality. So I thought that the percentages, 45 to 85%, were interesting because from a Buddhist perspective, it's all constructed. Right. It's all constructed. There, it, there really is no such thing as reality. Right. There is really no such thing as an objective world that ex- exists outside of our perception. That's right. And if you think, I mean, it's kind of like if a tree falls in the forest and nobody is there to hear it, did it make a sound? The, the Buddhists would say no. No, that's no, right. It's a straightforward answer. That's right. It's not. Right. A, it's, it's not a conundrum. Right. And I and I can I can understand the confusion because there is a there is a consensual reality. There is there is shared experience that we have that sort of lends credence to the notion that there is an objective reality. We are sitting in a room with a couch. Mm-hmm. You two are sitting on the couch. If you were to both be independently interviewed, you would both say, yes, I was sitting on a maroon-colored couch. Right. So That's real. The notion that the maroon-colored couch exists as an objective reality outside of our experience is reinforced by the fact that somebody else has experienced it too. Now, you may have very different experiences of that maroon-colored couch, like, yeah, I thought it was really beautiful. Yeah, I thought it was, yeah, I was sitting on a really ugly couch. I was sitting on a really beautiful couch. It was really comfortable. It was really uncomfortable. Or somebody might say, this is raspberry, not not maroon. Not maroon, right. Or, you know, or this is actually not maroon at all. It's purple. Right, exactly. (laughs) I thought it was yellow. (laughs) (laughs) So, the notion that there is some objective reality is already... A problem it's already a challenge absolutely absolutely and that's one reason why it makes it so difficult to talk about something that we call reality from a Buddhist perspective it's very difficult actually to sketch out for people in an ordinary way what is considered reality because it goes against what typically is a more Western perspective that there are objects Mm -hmm. in the world that we see and feel and hear. And so from a more Western perspective, that question of if a tree falls in the forest and there's no one there to hear it, or in the funnier form, if a man's wife is criticizing him and he doesn't hear it, is he still wrong? Um, (laughs) But it's the the idea is is if the tree falls in the forest and no one is there to hear it, does it still make a noise? From a Western perspective, that is a conundrum. It's a paradox. But from a Buddhist perspective, it has a very straightforward answer, which is no. Right. Because making a noise actually is that a person would hear a sound. Right. It's not a noise. It's a person hearing Hearing a sound. sound. Yes. And so if there's no person hearing a sound, there is no noise. Yes. And that is, I think, from, you know, an ordinary sort of everyday perspective, a little hard to grok. Yeah. So from a Buddhist perspective, the world is constantly created through the contact between what we would call an object of perception and a subjective contact with it. So hearing a sound means that 
something happens so that it seems as though the ear is in contact with something that disturbs what the ear is doing. Right. <laughs> and so the right. ear is actually hearing a sound. Now, once you dig down into that, again, from a Buddhist perspective, the Buddhist would say, okay, you have a human, you're manifesting in a human body. So you have this body, and this body has certain kinds of capacities. It's not the same thing as a, as a frog or a cat or a worm. All of those beings manifesting in those forms have different worlds. It's not like they're all perceiving the world that we're perceiving. So they have perceptions of something that for them is reality, but we can't know it. And that is because there's no reality that extends from here to there. Right. It's always in its perception. So what we call the real world is there's huge variation in it for individuals, for human beings, and then there's huge, huge variation across species or across all the sentient beings because plants are sentient too. So all of these beings are perceiving and interacting with something that they are creating. Right. And so the only things that really from, again, from a Buddhist perspective, this is so close to cognitive science. Everything I've said so far is what contemporary cognitive science mostly agrees with. Mm -hmm. I would say probably like 95%. Mm -hmm. And of course, I know, Jill, that you've read Bill Waldron's work. This is where I began to understand this. And, and Bill Waldron is a professor of Buddhist studies at Middlebury who goes into cognitive science to understand the Buddhist perspective mm -hmm. of world and perception and so on. From the Buddhist perspective, though, there are some <clears throat> teachings about reality that I think are important to understand the snow globe thing. One of those is that the world that we're in, this world, which is many times we said is samsara, which is the wheel of life and death, that the character of this world is that everything here is dukkha, or imperfect, limited. Everything in this world is impermanent. It is anicca. Everything in this world is dependent on causes and conditions mm -hmm. that are not essentialist. In other words, there is no rock. There are the causes and conditions that produce the perception of a rock in us. Right. But we don't know what a rock is mm -hmm. because the rock, <clears throat> if it has perceptions, has different perceptions than we have. Right. And so the, the nature of reality is it's imperfect, it's impermanent, it's impersonal. Yes. That goes against our ego. Yeah. It goes against everything that we take to be our values, our beliefs, and so on. But from the Buddhist perspective... The notion is that the world, the world as we perceive it, arises and passes away so quickly that we cannot perceive the flashes of it in any realistic way. So what we perceive is what we construct, and our constructions base are based a lot on our language and culture. And our so constructions appear solid. Right. And our constructions, appear solid. Right. And our constructions solid. appear solid and appear permanent. That's right. They, and which is where a lot of the confusion stems from. Right. One of the things that I like to point out to people when I'm teaching mindfulness is that without overtly challenging the notion of what reality is, to say that you have life circumstances and things arise, things are continually arising that are impersonal and therefore not directly in your control. Right. What is more personal and more importantly, more directly in your control is how you experience things. How you respond to and that, you And that comes directly from Shinzen, actually. Yeah. And yeah. Shinzen's whole system, which I think we'll talk about in a little bit, of see, hear, feel, of really putting yourself in touch with your perceptions, with, with, right. with your sense gates, with where the... Where, how and what you're perceiving. Right. And then, because once you do that, you can also start to see how you're holding it. And you you don't necessarily get to choose what the inputs are in any given moment, but you always, 
always have the ability to observe and work with how how you hold them. Right, how your you attitude, experience them. Your right. attitude yeah. towards what is arising. Right. So, you know, it's it's very interesting to me because again we're we're talking about a Buddhist perspective. And Shinzen here is Shinzen Young, who's a meditation teacher that Jill and I have studied with extensively, practiced with. But everything you just now said, Carl Jung would completely endorse. Hmm. And a lot of people don't know that, that Jung, who talks a lot about dreams and the unconscious and so on, said that the only thing we do in psychotherapy, the only thing, is to change the current conscious attitude towards someone's experience. We don't change anything else. But if we can work with a person so they could change their attitude, hmm. then they have what he calls subjective freedom. Yes. They are not bound to having certain kinds of outcomes because if something doesn't go the way you want it to go, you can work with your attitude towards that. So if you have the pain in your leg, you don't have to freak out. Or if you get a cancer diagnosis, you don't have to become panicked. You can actually work with the attitude towards the experience. Right. Now, of course, people say, oh, that's all well and good, but what about if your child dies? You know, can anybody actually experience that without having a particular attitude towards it. Of course, there are many examples in many stories, but one of the famous Buddhist stories is that there is a young woman who brings her dead child to the Buddha, and her name is Kisa Gotami. She has a child that's about, I suppose the child is supposed to be about a year or two old, and the child has died and she's panicked, and she's, she's angry, and she's enraged even, and she's going through the crowd, and she's saying to people, help me, help me, to somebody. Can somebody help me? Can somebody get someone to bring my child back to life? And, and somebody tells her about the Buddha. There's a master teaching. She goes to the Buddha. She gives him her dead child, and she says, I will do anything if you can help me with my child bringing my child back to life. And the Buddha says, I will help you if you can find a mustard seed. I want you to go to house to house until you can find a mustard seed. And of course she says at first, of course I'll find a mustard seed because everyone has mustard seeds. But he says, I would like you to find a mustard seed from a house in which no one has died. So she goes from house to house she knocks on the door, or whether it were doors, I suppose, but she somehow lets herself be known and then asks, you know, do you have a mustard seed? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Has anyone in this house died? And she hears about people dying from old age, from suicide, from being murdered, from having illnesses. House after house, there are people that have died in, from different means and so on. There is not a single house where she can find a mustard seed where there's no one, where no one has died. So she goes back to the Buddha after a, not too long. And she says, I recognize now what you're teaching me. You're teaching me that this is, this is impermanent and everyone dies. And I can't have this feeling about my child dying when everyone is dying. And so, you know, let's find a way to have a ceremony for my child and I'll become your student and then she becomes a student and she eventually becomes a teacher. So it's, it's a very good story about even a child dying, mm -hmm. that your attitude towards that, if it's deeply, deeply connected to reality, that it's impermanent, your response is actually different than if you take it personally and you think you get <laughs> freaked out that your child died and other people have children who didn't die, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, it's... That attitude towards experience and, and the, the real world is imperfect, impermanent, impersonal in the sense that the causes and conditions are not under your control. So that view of reality, just to start with reality, helps a lot. Yeah. 
You know, and I think Eleanor, what you were saying something like that too, that if you see that reality is not a thing out there that's doing something to you, but rather the conditions in which you are manifesting. Like there's no other way to be here except to be here in these conditions. And then it starts to become less personal and less difficult, really. There's something also about um, coming into the awareness or the mindfulness of, of finding meaning in what would be reactivity or how you meet an obstacle. When yeah. you can find the meaning, it all has meaning. It's all, it's all food for realization. It's about something. It has meaning. It's easier to take a breath. Mm-hmm. It's easier to hold. It's easier to just pause. Again, you have that kind of healthy belief. Well, that it's it you know it's useful it's not you know so you don't go into again all the inadequacies or all the doubt or all the wrong making and and get reactive mm-hmm. that's an extraordinary i mean that gives you real quality of life mm-hmm. well it's a matter of moving away from the poor me yes. usually well, it's you know, not because the poor me yeah. is the is the main yeah. thing that most people suffer I know. in addition to the pain they do the poor me thing, which causes more suffering. So that's and the, projecting. Right, and that's also taking it personally. The Takes poor me personally. is taking it's, it personally. Yeah, right. The poor me is a total personal. It's right. like about me. Right. I, you right. know, I'm the one who had the worst right. case scenario here kind of thing. Right. And that actually gets away from the fact that you're in causes and conditions you don't know about. Right. And we're in this narcissistic age where everything's about the me, the I, the ego, the fortification of the ego. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, and a lot of times people, even in their search for some kind of justice or fairness or whatever, get very involved in what happened to me instead of the nature of reality. So knowing something about the nature of reality allows you then to interpret what happens right. and your attitude towards it in a, in a bigger way that I think does allow you to find uh, the meaning that Kisigotami was finding was this, is, this being here thing is impermanent. Right. Everybody's died. Everybody's going to die. I mean, everybody around, all of us are going to die in a hundred years. None of us will be here. Right. And, you know, as in some of the teachings on impermanence, they'll, they'll do it in a room of 300 people and saying, a hundred years from now, all of us will be gone. Right. That's a really right. interesting idea. We're gone. Boom. It's gone. And so the idea that somehow your own grasp of this has some sort of permanence mm-hmm. is actually often problematic on many levels because people believe, oh, now this is forever. Well, and people also take impermanence then as an affront. Yes. Yes. So, Dear. what do you mean? What do you mean? I'm like, wait a minute. Something got screwed up because I got sick. Like yeah. I was not yeah. supposed to get it's sick. Right. Something right. got screwed up because I'm dying, right. and I was not supposed to That's be right. dying. Right. Right. And right. even if people qualify it with, I'm not supposed to be dying now. Yeah. Well, first of all, you don't get to choose. That's right. In general, I mean, and you can argue, well, if you don't do this, but you do more of that, okay, well, maybe you can, I mean, in the grander scheme of things, you've got plus or minus 40 years, Yeah. you know, exactly. okay, so plus or minus 40 years, yeah, maybe you could have lived a little longer or whatever, but you're still going to die, and you're still, in all likelihood, going to decline in some way, even if it's not with a specific disease. Yeah. That's, that's the nature of being. That's that part is, of the contract in yes, being it is. That's well, the contract the, you signed. The moment, the the moment you were born, yeah. you started dying. Or even when you were conceived, Even actually. when you were conceived, <laughs> yes. yeah. I mean, it's so, the moment you actually just boom into being, right, right. you're beginning to die. That's right. You're going to right. boom out of being someday. <laughs> yes, yes. So it's I like, like when you realize you're booming in and booming out all the time, right. Right. it gets to be less, less concerning. Yes. You know, and yes. so again, that knowing something about reality can be a tremendous relief if you actually recognize that that sort of impermanence and the impersonality yeah and the impersonality are actually great freedoms because you don't have to constantly be controlling everything to make it turn out right yes you know or when you have a, a an awareness again of say the transcendent dimension of reality that might not fit into like Buddhist terminology but you know where you in the face of negativity in the face of harm in the face of victimization or any of those kind of negative zones you 
look for the transform. You mm -hmm. look for a way of turning it, turning it to something that's more useful, more positive, more holistic, more transcendent. That's another, I yeah. mean, that's yeah, another yeah. approach. Yes. Yeah. No, I mean, and that is the attitude towards your immediate experience. Right. If you... If you embrace, for example, a Christian path right. or... Would that be more Christian what I'm talking? Well, not necessarily, but I mean, because in Buddhism as well, there is the Buddha nature. Right, which is which a transcendent dimension. Which is, the, which is dimension. The, the nature of uh, love and okay. compassion within this world, yeah. you know, and then beyond this world. And so it's not so different from the idea of the mind of God mm -hmm. or, you know, being able to transcend the moment because you realize that the moment somehow is teaching you, right. you know, that it's right. not just a moment right. of pain or misery or right. whatever. Right. So that attitude towards reality and then having some knowledge of reality, that reality is not the world around you. Right. It's the world you're constructing all of the time. Yes. And that actually yes. is, is a little hard to get yeah. for people to get that it's a practice. straight out. Well, it's it's also like an insight if you yes. right. realize yes. that that's that you know that this yes. is happening. Yeah. You begin to see things differently, hear yeah. things differently, yeah. feel things differently. Exactly. There's a way in which I think it might be a little bit easier, sort of a stepping stone to that in the book Sapiens mm -hmm. by Harari, 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 thank Paul, you. Harari. Yes. Um, yes. And the, he, one of one of one of the pieces of the book, early in the book, that was a huge epiphany for me, mm -hmm. was when he talked about the fact that one of the reasons why Homo sapiens became the sole surviving hominid species mm -hmm. on the planet was because of a cognitive ability that we developed, a mental ability that we developed. And that mental ability was the ability to create and believe in myth as though it were an objective reality. That's right, so. And so... Um, and the reason that we that's part of our survival history is because species like Homo sumatris or Homo neanderthalus could only gather in groups of about 150 because right. you had to have very few degrees of separation. You had to know the person. You had to be able to recognize right. them to know you could trust them. Once we developed the ability to create myth, then we had, we could, I my myth is that I am American. There is nothing tangible. There is that's no... Right. That's Nothing, right. no physical reality called America. There is Earth that I live on that right. happens to have been designated America, but there's nothing different about the soil under my feet than there is anywhere. Um, anywhere. Right. So, but so the myth is that this country called America exists, and the myth is that I live on this piece of land called America, and therefore I'm American. I don't need to know you. It doesn't matter how many degrees of separation there are. If you also call yourself American, I can trust you because now we can we both identify with the same myth. And so I and I love that because that explained to me so much about identification. Yes. Yes. But the reason that I think it's relevant to this topic is because when you step back and you recognize so many of the things that we identify with, so many of the things that we hold as objective truths. Right. I'm American. I am of this religion. Or that money exists. Or that money exists. Or yes. that companies exist. That's right. The companies you know? exist. I mean, the example he gives in the book is Peugeot. Right, right? I know. What I is know. a Peugeot? Right. I mean, as, right. as in the company. Right. And actually, he, it's does an call it, he calls it fiction instead of myth. I mean, yeah, yeah, he calls I think it fiction. you could, yeah, yeah, yeah. You could, you could use the, either of those words. But, yes, he does. But, but, but fiction it, often is considered a little bit lower level than myth. Mm -hmm. and yeah. I, you know, and That's I, fine, and yeah. I, but I, I, like, I like the fact that he called it fiction because uh -huh. it does have this quality that he points out, which is you're talking about something that is not actually empirically present. Right. You can't touch it. Right. You can't, you can't count it. So the other hominoid species, the other human species, couldn't do that. Right. So they couldn't say, I saw Joe this morning and he was with your wife. Right. They, only if Joe was in the room or in the tribe could they say, there's Joe. Right. They had language. Right. Just like all the higher apes do. They can talk about anything that's present to each other and symbolize it. But they can't talk about something that's not present. And that was the difference. Right. And it's both the gift and, and the curse. And the curse. Right. right. Because that's, and, sorry. Yeah. And well, also in terms of what you're saying about, you know, being an Amer the myth of being an American, I think one of the things that's happening now is we've got a fracturing of the myths. There was a myth that 
we're, we're Americans. Or fiction. We sh- a fiction. fiction. A yeah. fiction. And, and so there's just having that, that's very confusing for so many people because suddenly, you know, there's, there's like this divisiveness again and separation. Like, my America's not your America. Do you know what I'm... Uh, yeah, you know, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And that's happening yeah. now at such a speed. But of course it really never was. Right. Well, of course never, not. Right. But you may have subscribed yeah. to the idea that yeah. there was more unity in and the fiction of America. Well, there you go. Right. You know, <laughs> then, then, then you, might have, right. you might have thought... Oh, well, foolish there Eleanor. Was, <laughs> there was some sort of thing... There was some sort of thing that unified right, right. the fictional America, so where of course the so-called Native Americans wouldn't have subscribed to that, right. and they might have said, "My gosh, our story takes precedent over yours because we were here first. Right. right? You know, and so there, there are. I mean, it's a, it's sort of like we agree to a particular right. fiction about something. Right. I always think money is a good one. It is a really good one. Because people put so much importance on money. Exactly. Right. And it yes. doesn't yeah. exist anywhere. No. It, it only exists because we say because it, it say exists. It's a story. And, and it's a story. And the reason that, that this fits so well into this topic is because if you can recognize the intangible, non-objective stories right. and fictions that we tell ourselves you know, about money and about the value of money, mm-hmm. about, you know, other stories, about belonging to a company, a country, a right. religion, all right. of that, that's all, those are all stories that we have given mm-hmm. reality right. to. That's right. When you recognize that those things don't actually have objective reality, then you that brings you one step closer to mm-hmm. recognizing that actually everything that you experience, even right. things that you can tap right. your knuckles against. Right. Yes. right. And I found, you know, during my long years of living in Paris, it was such an awakening for me because they never talked about money. They never came and asked you for paper or branding uh, certifications or any of the kind of things that are such a constant here. But the fact that they never talked money was such a a liberation for me, mm-hmm. you know, and uh, it was just. But you, you know, still probably had to pay for things. You did, but you didn't <laughs> have the focus on money. There were there were there were other things that were that were valued, you know, and you weren't determined by your bank account, right? Which was a, a liberation. Well, you um, know, the, I mean, because of the overemphasis here on, um, yeah. Well, it's really you know again when you say here. Of course, there are some people that think and talk a lot about money, and there and there are many people in America who do who don't. not, and, and who don't so, have any money. And- well, well, <laughs> there's nobody without any yeah. because otherwise they'd be well. They possibly could be living in a commune in Vermont, <laughs> but uh, mostly mostly people are having money. They have to get it, use it to get around. If somebody's got to pay the taxes, somebody on the has land. To so somebody's taxes, got money. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, so. I wasn't really talking about it on that level, but yeah, yes, right. Yes, you yes. know, so these fi- yeah. so the fictions actually where they intersect with the issues of subjectivity, so to speak, is that we do embrace these stories, yes. and the stories then create a sense that somehow we know what's going on in the world mm-hmm. around us. So to say that that reality itself does not exist in the way that we believe it exists, but that we have experiences that are individual and subjective, and those are, the, the individual subjective is the preponderance of all of our experience, and it's mostly not consensual. It's, it's very interesting, like if you look at people's, if you actually measure what they're seeing, what kinds of colors, what they're seeing right. as forms, what they hear, what the sounds are, and also what they feel physically and so on, there's so much individuality in it. How do we ever get to any consensus? Right. The stories. Yes. It's the language. Yes. It's the stories yes. we tell ourselves, the way we perceive. The stories we tell each other. Each other, yeah. yes. Yeah. Ourselves and each other. Yes. Like the ceiling is above and the floor is below, and we're in a room here with a maroon couch. None of that is fixed in the way that we come to believe it is. And one thing we know is that infants don't experience it that way. Right. Human infants, you have to grow and develop to experience those things as being stable mm-hmm. around you. So getting back to the issue of the snow globe and, we, and, and why it's so hard to establish that sense of agreement with others, let's just talk about the experience of the individual and how that works. And here we're going to draw on Shinzan Young's uh, framework 
for what it is that allows us to construct that sense that we are inside of a body with a world outside of us because that's not given and that's not there for the infant. You have to develop it and every day when you wake up you have to recreate it and one way you know that is that if you're not quite awake you're kind of in the dreaming world where you're creating a different kind of environment you get confused when you come out and you open your eyes you say where am I is this where I was or not so there's this other way that we create reality for ourselves which is while we're dreaming and there we can fly and pass through walls and we can transform our bodies and so on. So, and, and when we're in the dream, it seems perfectly real. Mm -hmm. it, doesn't, it doesn't seem like the dream is in us. Mm -hmm. It seems like we're in the dream. Right. And actually, it's the same when we're awake. It's not that the dream is in us. It's like we're in a dream that we don't wake up from. And it is that dream of constantly creating a fictional world right. and then doing it together. But so individually, we have these experiences and I, I'm going to mention them and, and then I'm going to ask you, Jill, just to say what they are uh, and I'll chime in, but of seeing seeing a world so-called out there mm -hmm. and then seeing a so-called world in here, mm -hmm. which is in your mind's eye where you see images and so on, hearing a so-called world out there, the sounds that you hear, the other people's voices, uh, the things that you are hearing around you, and then hearing into the ways you're talking to yourself in your own mind, and then any other sounds that you're making internally, mantras, prayers, whatever. Memory, things you're remembering. Remember, and you're yeah. usually remembering those in right, right. language, but right. sometimes in images. Right. And then the feeling, which is feeling the, the boundaries of your so-called physical body and the space around it, and then feeling the emotional centers that seem to be inside of you in your gut and your solar plexus and your throat and your head. So we're seeing out and seeing in, hearing out and hearing in, feeling out and feeling in. And if you could kind of fill out those categories and then we're gonna talk about how they make a snow globe mm -hmm. for each individual. Mm -hmm. Fill out those categories in what way? Because I think you just did a really good job of describing them. Well, add anything that I missed. I mean, I think most people don't really recognize that they're talking to themselves most of the time, all of the time, mm -hmm. in a stream of what used to be called sometimes a stream of consciousness. But mm -hmm. it's actually kind of a jumbled, sometimes you know, clear words, sometimes a word here and there. But they're saying a lot to themselves. Mm -hmm. And then also, you know, they're hearing things from the outside, which may be either things that may be language mm -hmm. or not language and so on. So just kind of sketch that out a little bit, the hearing in and hearing out. So one of the things that I think is an interesting practice to try, because these are all part of a toolkit that Shenzhen has of, of mindfulness meditation practices, to really get a sense of even even in the external world, the world of sound, that how you're experiencing the world, again, is very much subjective, is if you're, if you're sitting in a place that's relatively quiet, okay, so you've decided you want to sit and meditate or just sit and, and be peaceful or contemplative in a place that's relatively quiet, and then all of a sudden in the room next door, somebody turns on a really loud radio and it happens to be a radio station with music that you dislike intensely. Or it could be one of music that you like intensely, but in any case, all of a sudden your attention is drawn to that sound. And that sound becomes almost the entirety of your perception. And you, there's a lot of emotional reactivity that happens in the body. There's probably agitation. There's there's there, so there's all this emotional sensation that that results from that. And anyway, one of the ways of working with that is then to broaden your your sense of hearing more and see if you can hear your own heartbeat. Start mm -hmm. listening to mm -hmm. the words in your head that are saying, "God, this sucks. I really right. wanted to sit here and be quiet." And one of the things that I've done with groups that I've done this practice with is say, okay, so we're in a room where there was a clock ticking 
And it was actually at a health club, and somebody went into the spinning room and put on heavy metal right next door to where we were meditating. And my first, my first notion as a meditation facilitator was to get up and ask them to shut, shut the sound, right, shut the music. But I thought, no, this is perfect. What a wonderful opportunity. So I said, okay, now broaden your experience to include the ticking clock. Now broaden your experience to hearing your own breath because you can still hear your own breath. And notice what happens to the sound in the spinning room, right? That, that sound that seemed to take over your entire world three minutes ago. So by broadening and by recognizing that this is all part of a constructed experience, no one thing necessarily has to overwhelm us or grab us. It's all... It's all part of the experience. The same is true for feelings, for physical sensations, working with pain. Mm -hmm. Part of working with pain is you can, you can choose to focus on the area that's painful and then begin to notice the area around the painful area. What's happening to the muscles in the area around where you're feeling pain? They're probably starting to tense. And as those muscles tense, eventually there's going to be kind of a generalized anxiety in your body, right? So the more you work with your sensory experience and the more clarity you have mm -hmm. about it, ultimately the more equanimity and the, you the, can and have. And the equanimity... So again, you've touched on so many things that are so important. Most of our suffering is based on the stories we tell ourselves. And we're telling ourselves those stories when we're actually perceiving things going on. For example, I wish that that person would turn down that awful music is a whole set of fiction about everything that's going on. And what it boils down to is this, I don't like this. That's what it right. boils down to. Right. Is I don't like this. Right. And if you actually start to listen into yourself, what you will notice is as you go around in the world, you probably will be saying to yourself, I like this. I don't like that. I like this. And there'll be a preponderance of, I don't like that. Yes. Those will be the things you remember that tend to characterize your day mm -hmm. when actually all it is is just your preference instead of, oh, now this is happening. Oh, now this is happening. And once you actually have, so equanimity is a friendly attitude to right. anything, right. whether it's pain or pleasure or whatever. Oh, that's interesting. It's a kind of matter of fact, friendly, open attitude. And if you can cultivate that for much of your subjective experience, you're mostly pretty satisfied with things. Yeah. And it's pretty impersonal. It's not so personal to you. So that's kind of like the plus side of developing this, like you said, sort of holding in a larger range. There is also simply the clarity of recognizing if you, if you work with your hearing, you'll notice that you can hear through your right ear, through your left ear, you can hear sounds above, below, you can hear lots of things that you don't think you're hearing, but you are hearing mm -hmm. them and you're just kind of blending them together. Often what's dominating your hearing is the stuff you're saying to yourself. So instead of actually hearing, what you're doing is you're, you're telling yourself a story. Yeah. You know, that's a jackhammer, that's a bird, you know. This is good music, this is bad music. And then as soon as you tell yourself that story, and you know, I'm certainly captive to my stories. I was in the car the other night and I was a little overwhelmed with having seen a lot of couples and riding with my partner and he was playing opera, some Puccini thing. I mean, I did not feel that I could tolerate it. It was like the voices in my head were competing with the voices in the music. Now, if I had cultivated equanimity toward the whole thing, you know, and I, I probably could have tried, but instead I said, would you mind turning that off? <laughs> and I felt a lot better because then I could just hear the voices in my head. Right. But that, that whole sort of complexity of hearing is very, very important to get yes. a handle on. Yes. Because when we listen to human voices also, 
we tend to then begin our own stories internally. Those stories dominate what we believe is going on, mm -hmm. and we can get heavily into the fictions of our own tribe, like, you know, this is no good, or this doesn't make sense, or that costs too much, or whatever mm -hmm. those, those are. So on the hearing side of things, just the hearing in and hearing out, very complex. Yes. And also that perception is the first that's organized in her uterine, four months in her uterine, you can identify your mother's voice before you're born you prefer your mother's voice to other sounds. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, by all the Buddha's teachings, you can hear after your breath stops. And so the consciousness lingers around the body, in particularly in regard to hearing. And I know in my own experience, a few times when I've been, when I've had surgery, where I've been under general anesthesia, I have heard what was going on. Mm -hmm. I never saw anything. Mm -hmm. but I could hear things and later remembered things that were said. Mm -hmm. And so I, I feel like I've even had that experience of hearing when the consciousness is shut down, you know, mm -hmm. if, um, there was enough consciousness to still organize hearing. Then seeing is an interesting one too, seeing out and seeing in. Mm -hmm. Do you want to say anything about that? Or maybe Eleanor, because you work with imagery. Yeah, you, actually that would be great. So, yeah, cause, you know, because yeah. imagery is important in your work. And you realize you, I'm sure, realize that people create images in their minds. Yeah, I mean, I don't really separate image. I mean, it's all one to me. Do you know the image? I don't see it's out there. It's it. You know, it's it's just I don't separate it. I don't so, see seeing out, seeing in. It's just one to me. So when I you're dreaming, just, what do you think you're doing when you're dreaming? I don't dream. You, I mean, I don't, I don't dream. You do. <laughs> you I, I mean, my word is, I live dream. <laughs> no, but you don't remember no. your nighttime dreams? No. Mm -mm. Do you ever? Rarely. When you're thinking of a piece of art that you're going to make, or uh, a film, or something, yeah. do you not have any visual sense of it before I, it exists in reality? Yes, I do. I mean, I'm totally visual. Language is not my thing. So that's the seeing in. The, ah, so the, maybe it's just the definition that the definition. I don't, right. you know, because right, we're right, often... Right. Saying the same thing, I just have different, I have a different language. So, the, yeah, the yeah. image that's in your mind's yeah. eye? Yeah, the image in my mind's eye, which is what gets, the same, the same way when I talk about the camera, the camera responds to what the eye sees, yeah. you know. So a lot of people who work with me in terms of the camera, it has to do with what I see, it has to do with the kind of consciousness I have that I bring to the camera. So that's your mind's eye. Yeah, that's it's my not, mind's it's, eye. It's your mind's eye right. that's guiding you. Right. So right. your mind's eye is seeing right. things, and you wouldn't say they're out there. Yeah, I mean, I don't go into, I just, it's not, well, I yeah. Well, yeah, see, it's yeah. useful to hold yeah. that distinction, because we start to get the impression, for example, I could look at you and I could think, wow, you look angry. Uh-huh. But that's my mind's eye. Uh -huh. There's nothing to do with you. Yes, exactly. And so people look at each other often, and yeah. they say things Projection. like, well, it's not even projection, it's perception. Ah. It's total perception. It's like I'm organizing a perception yeah. of you. But then you're you... projecting it. No. Uh -huh. No, it's a perception. Uh -huh. It's the same thing as to say, I see the table. Uh -huh. I look at you and I say, oh, this person looks angry. Uh -huh. That's my perception. It's not a projection, uh -huh. because a projection would be more organized, like uh -huh. I'm feeling angry, and so then I sort of experience you as being angry. Uh -huh. This is more like I organize a perception based on the way I see things, and you look angry. Right, literally see. I see you yeah. as angry. There's no cognition. There's no narrative. It's just seeing. Because I have a mind's eye, and in my mind's eye, that's the way anger looks. That's, I mean, it, it could be based on many, many things. It could be based on my parents. It could be based on, it just, I don't even know what it's based on. And the point is that it has very little to do with what you're actually feeling. It's simply Polly's perception, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And mm -hmm. so, so when you see out, you're seeing these things around you that you think, oh, that's that. Oh, that's, that's a, an old white man. Oh, that's a, a Native American, this or that, or oh, that's Mexican, or that's Chinese. All of those things, now some of that is also narrative, narrative that you're saying, 
but there are many, many things that you see that are not at all somehow out there. They're a part of the way you're constructing right. the visual world. Now, where that becomes extreme, of course, is if you're psychotic. Right, and hallucinating. If you're psychotic, yeah. you do what we call hallucinating, but, you know, those of us who aren't doing it, but I'll tell you, if you talk to a psychotic person about what they're seeing that you're not seeing, they have a huge logic for it. They are not just making it up. Right. And so people say often, for example, you know, about hypochondriasis, for example, that's a really good illustration when somebody says, I'm sure I have cancer because they can see it on their body. They feel it inside. They're absolutely certain. And if, you know, after talking to them, you say, you know, I think maybe you're anxious about the way that arm feels or something, and it might not actually be cancer, the person will usually say, are you saying that I'm making this up? No, I'm not. I'm saying you're perceiving it that way. You're not making it up. Because there's Because that no, is your experience. That's your experience. Well, actually, you're not making it all, up. All of experience, experience is, is made, made up. Made up. Yeah, yeah, it's all fabricated. <laughs> yes, it's, it's all, all fabricated. fabricated. Yeah. And so because there of, we are. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And because of that then, when we get into seeing each other or hearing each other, we need to be very careful. Yes. Because you are hearing often what is in your I mean you're seeing what's in your mind mind's eye. And very often what you're hearing isn't even I mean you could say it it's in your mind's ear, but often what we're hearing is actually our own voice internally narrating. Yes. What we believe is going on. We're not even hearing the other person's voice. And I, of course, find that in dialogue therapy or real dialogue when I ask people, well, what did she say? Could you paraphrase what she said? And even if the other person believes that, that he or she has listened closely, often they cannot paraphrase it because they didn't listen. Right. And then even if I paraphrase it, Often what they're saying to themselves is, I'm not remembering this. I'm not going to be able to remember this. So they can't because right. they're listening to the voice in the mind. Right. They're listening to their... So as soon, as soon as someone starts talking, we are already formulating what we are going to say in response. Or it triggers a memory and we fall into that memory and then that's what we bring forward as the next part of the conversation. Right. So... That's often called in the blind spot work, it's called implicit association. Mm -hmm. So somebody begins to say something or you start to have an experience and then you bring in all these implicit associations. Mm -hmm. And so then you have a picture in your mind's eye about what this is. You have a narration inside about what it is and you're no longer interested in what it is. Right. is. You've captured it subjectively and you believe it's objective. And right. that's where you fall into the difficulty. You really believe that isn't an old white man. Or you really believe that is an angry woman. Or you believe that is, even you could say, you know, you, most people know mirages. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you look down the road and you see what looks like absolutely a puddle. Mm -hmm. Turns out there's no puddle there. Right. But that's happening all the time to you, not just occasionally. And so it particularly with other people, where it becomes very important is just in recognizing that you might not be seeing anything about the other person. Mm -hmm. You might not be hearing anything. An old white man or angry woman actually is, is, not, is not a descriptor. It's, a, it's also a story. It's and a story. And that's yes. the problem. That's right. That's right. That's the problem. That's and that, right. to me, and this is a subject for another podcast I think but that to me is also part of the problem and kind of harkens back to what we spoke about in our last podcast about self-righteousness and moral superiority right. because actually we're not hearing and seeing each other we are we are creating stories about yes. each other and then moving into those stories right. yes. and from and from the vantage point of those stories we are we are considering ourselves both righteous and superior that's right that's right and so you know once you have us the idea that everyone's in this complex snow globe nobody has a clear vision right. of the other person or the other person's ideas or anything 
without the inquiry, without the dialogue. You don't know. So, you know, I've been with so many people, couples in therapy, where one person says, you're lying to me. And the other person says, I'm not. And yet the only way to actually understand that difference is to go deeply into what you're hearing, what you're seeing, what you remember. So the person who says, you're lying to me, has to say, I have this impression that you said ABC last week, instead of, I am sure you said ABC right. last week. As soon as I say, I am sure, you're going to defend yourself. Right. And at that point, you're actually going to protect yourself and promote yourself. So with inside of your subjective snow globe, all of the snow is going to be shaken up at the moment that I accuse you of doing something to me that you do not believe you did. Mm -hmm. And at that point, mostly you'll pay attention to the snow. Right. You're not going to be hearing me anymore. Mm -hmm. You're going to be defending your snow in there. And a lot of the time, I would say more than 85% of the time, when people disagree, they stop hearing, they stop seeing each other. Mm -hmm. What they're doing is in their mind's eye, yeah. in their mind's ear, and then it activates the emotional centers in the body. Right. And once those emotional centers are activated, then the limbic system is activated, and then you get the fight or flight, or you get the emotional memories overtaking any other perceptions. And so then, essentially what's going on is that your whole perceptual system has closed down, and you are perceiving something entirely inside of your snow globe, but unless you're psychotic, other people will believe you. I mean, they'll right. say, yes, you know, that must have happened to her because she's completely convinced right. of that happening, where it might not have happened. It right. might have been only her own subjective experience. So, you know, again, that idea of seeing in or seeing out becomes valuable when you recognize that there's no consensual world. Right. And that if you see something through your lens, it might not be the case. You have to ask the other person, are you angry? You know, is that is that really going on? Or am I perceiving something that is not at all a part of your experience? There are many, many things that people say to each other, like you're manipulative, you're narcissistic, you know, you're dominant. You have a you're passive aggressive. You're passive aggressive, and all of those things yeah. are just from That's the a great kindness, though, to be able to say that to another. To no. say to be able to, you know, just have that objectivity um, in terms of how you, you know, not how you're perceiving another. They mean that kind of yeah. like asking them yes. rather, yeah. rather than assuming yeah. that that's exactly. the way they are. Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And so that's reality. That's a great kindness. Though. That's like reality. You know, that's it's a practice as well. Right. Yeah. It's like right. higher well, intelligence as well. <laughs> well, let's say if you if we're, if you are without any modesty about your own snow globe, if you think all the time when you're going around that your snow globe is right, yeah. is always right, yeah. you you actually are going to have a very troubled life. Yeah. yeah. Because That's you're the age we're in. Constantly yeah. irritated. And one of the things that you I mean that you just brought up for me is that part of the remedy to snow globism yes, right. <laughs> whatever we want to call well, it is, <laughs> is is I mean equanimity is a big piece yes, of it yes. the other piece of it is curiosity curiosity yes, yes absolutely yeah. without the cure and curiosity is also a test yes. that you can ask yourself right yeah. if you have no curiosity yeah. about the conversation you're in if you think yeah. you already know exactly what's going on then you're actually enclosed entirely in your subjectivity. That's right. And there's that, yeah, just to also have that healthy hunger for inquiry, you know, to ask, to be able to ask the question, to be able to step outside of yourself enough to ask the question about another person's reality rather than your projection of what you think is going on. Well, again, to, to try to be clear, it's not a projection, because we've talked about uh, projection right, so right, much. Right. Yeah. So this is a perception. Yeah. And so the snow globe thing is really about our perceptions, not our cognitions uh -huh. so much, although uh -huh. there's a narrative thing that goes on in your own mind. But if you, if you recognize that your perceptions are largely individual and subjective, then you almost always will ask a question because you'll know that you're generally speaking from your own point of view, your own 
snow globe your own narrative and that's not aligned with somebody else it's re-education you know? well <laughs> i i think it's you know it's in a way, it's, it's reality. But yeah. also, I'm, I, I mean, yeah, on to, the, to we're talking to, people, to a yeah. general audience here on the podcast. I mean, this is also a very specific way of looking at things, and it takes skill. Yeah. I mean, I don't think it's something that people normally do without being re-educated or going deeper or coming into a, a greater understanding of what all of this means. Well, that's why we're doing it. a podcast. Well, exactly, exactly, exactly. Yeah. One of the things, one of the things that I also want to clarify, because this comes up sometimes mm-hmm. when we're ta- when I'm talking about this with um, with groups where we are doing mindfulness right. practices, um, just to go back to equanimity for a moment. Right. So there is some confusion about equanimity because what people often say to me is, well, what about social justice? Right. 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 What about what about the fact that what they're doing is wrong. Yes, I could have. I mean, we did that as a chorus. Yes, yes. Do you want to talk about that? Well, not really, but <laughs> no. I will continue but, with you. Well, well, it's important. That, well, it's important because so, people are very confused about all of this. I mean, people are really, really confused. So what? What I would say is, how do you know that the other person is wrong? Right. 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 And I until, mean, until, until to, you really understand the other yeah. person's intentions, yes. right. I mean, this you is don't also know. what Byron Katie's been doing in her work, which has had so much, you know, um, it's been so useful to so many people to just it, it, be able to even ask the question, how do you know that that's true? You know, in terms of the work well, so that that's she's been doing. So that's what this whole sort of snow globe. Right. Yes. <laughs> and so when you believe that someone else is doing something that is wrong, right. The very first thing that has to happen is a little modesty. Yeah, and stem back. And to start with your own perception. Right, that's to start right. with recognizing yeah. that that what you are perceiving is your experience. That's right. And that unless right. unless you inquire into what the other person is right. experiencing and what the other person is perceiving, right. you can't know. That's right. right. You cannot know. You right. cannot know. And if you're holding the intention of doing good, which is where social justice and that's a wrong thing. And there's right. any one of a million things you can outline as wrong. But if you hold your intention as creating less suffering in the world yes. and making the world a better place, you don't start with your own perception and your own judgment. That's right. You that's start right. with with inquiry. With inquiry. Right. And and right. and and um yeah. Because holding your own perception is moral superiority. Right. It's assuming that you know much more than everybody else and you can say, this is wrong. Now, I, I always make the exception, like if someone has a gun in your face or somebody is really harming someone else, you can act directly on those things. But how many times in your life have you had a gun in your face? Right. How many times have you seen somebody doing something directly to someone else. Most of the time, we're operating on these fictions. Right. The stories that we tell ourselves about why this is wrong, why it won't work, and then we keep on with those stories, and then those stories can motivate our actions to actually call out someone, cancel someone, right. ghost someone, right. because we feel that we know that they are wrong, but we've never asked them. Right. We've never made one inquiry into what's going on in your snow globe you know how is it over there and for me the reason why this is so common sense and not really um, unusual at all is because once you get it and it's kind of easy in this way just ask right that's that's all there is to it instead of saying you're wrong Ask a question. What do you mean by that? Right. Or help me understand the way you're seeing this. When you add those pieces, you're fighting a lot less. Right. And you're also creating less suffering for yourself, not to mention other people. But then the world is smoother. Mm-hmm. You're happier. And it's pretty simple. It's pretty simple. You know, just the question. Right. And you're, open, you're creating the space to come not out of your own emotional reactivity also, but to come out of 
an understanding that is mutually that's right constructed 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 yes yeah and and so so people will so one of the things that I like to say is one of the reasons why mindfulness practices and the practice of see hear feel shouldn't right. see hear feel or to most clarify of them, your see right, hear feel is, is, is yes. It, yeah so that that clarification and that equanimity actually creates the space yes. in which to make those inquiries and develop and create that mutual, mutually constructed understanding. You know, I just had an insight right now when you were speaking that is something that I've never truly seen into before that's, that's to me pretty remarkable anyway. So there is a teaching that the Buddha did with one of his disciples. I think it was... Um, it wasn't Anatta, it was the Sariputra. So Sariputra of the six disciples, I think there were initially, was the most intellectual and kind of skeptical. And so he was, you know, everybody else got enlightened in the first two days that the Buddha spoke to them, and he took like two weeks. <laughs> and so the Buddha was trying, so Sariputra was saying essentially, how could this world be a Buddha field? I, I don't because there's so much suffering here. How could it be a Buddha field? And the Buddha tapped his foot twice on the ground and everything sparkled with energy and beauty. And Sariputra saw it. And then the Buddha tapped his foot twice more and it closed. And that was the inquiry. Basically, Sariputra said, how could this be a Buddha field? And the Buddha said, look, I'll show you. And then I'll show you how it's not. But I never saw it as the inquiry between the two of them. Mm -hmm. I saw it more like the Buddha is showing and teaching. But no, Sariputra is asking, Yes. how could this be? You're yeah. telling me this, but I don't get it. Right. And the Buddha said, oh, it's like this. You have to change your attitude. Right. And when you do, this is how it looks. And then... Hey, by the way, your attitude is like this. Right. That's how it looks to you. And so that inquiry can also open up something, a perspective to you that you've never seen before. Right. Because you only saw your own snow globe. And so you didn't even know right. that this could be a Buddha field. And then, then you ask, how could it be? Right. Help me understand that. And then you see something that you could not have seen on your own. And that also... I think gets back to that reason why self-righteousness is so problematic because you're so cut off right. from others and those who see it differently. Yeah. You know, um, and I mean, it, it may seem impossible to imagine the world as a Buddha field, mm -hmm. but if you ask someone who sees it that way, you know, you might see it. You might see it. You might see it. Yeah. And so, um, so that's a great place to end. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks so much for listening. And to continue the conversation, you can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can find past episodes of the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and Castbox. Enemies from War to Wisdom is recorded and produced by Chris Coltrane. <laughs>